Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today again with Mr. Larry Vickers. Today we're going to talk through the XM8. There are not very many people out there with any hands-on experience, and you have not only that, but you almost have an XM8 mm -hmm. here. So first off, what is this rifle? What this is, Tom Bostic, Tommy built Tactical built it. He's kind of, you know, we're, renowned throughout the United States for doing G36 custom work. Okay. He also has kind of a, an accessory package he puts on S SL8s, HK SL8s, to give them an XM8 style look. Okay, yeah, I've seen those. He does like SL8 to G36 conversions. Correct, too. exactly. Okay. So he's well known in that community, good guy. I was able to source some real XM8 parts. I was able to get a real butt stock, a real trigger housing, okay, and a real hand guard, and a real later in the game, I was able to get a real flip-up front sight gas block, which was unique nice. to the XM8. Okay. With all that stuff together, I got a hold of him and I said, hey man, I got kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity here to put together an XM8 post sample, mm -hmm. made it full auto. And um, and it took him like a couple years. I said, take wow. your time. I, I just want your very best effort. It doesn't matter how long it takes, just do the very best job you can. Took him a couple years, did a bang up job. I'm actually going to get together with him at some point. We've both been very busy, and do a video on it yeah, for my YouTube channel. Definitely need and to. Def that's the plan. Um, but see, he assembled the receiver essentially from G36 receiver chunks. Okay. And really had to do a lot of plastic body work to get it to the XM8 configuration because it's significantly different than a G36. Okay. It, it's G36 like, but it is not the same. All right. It's really a remarkably well done gun. Yeah, he did a really good job. He did. So for people who aren't at all familiar with this thing, um, XM8 was an outgrowth of the G36. The mm -hmm. G36 came first, and then mm -hmm. the U.S. Army was potentially looking for a new combat rifle and they held some trials and HK came up with this thing and it actually got relatively far through the process. It got yeah. far enough to get an X designation. Well, what happened, you had the OICW, which right. of course was a grenade launcher with a 5.56 yep. rifle paired between it. And then some of the powers that be in the army decided, hey, let's look at trying to bust these apart. Okay. You know, and to try, instead of trying to have this all kind of be all in one, let's bust them apart. So HK then took that um, and kind of that direction from the Army and kind of did a, a modernized or an Americanized or whatever, a sexier G36, if you will. As a matter of fact, they got a hold of, kind of like Breda does, they got a hold of some outside design people hmm. uh, out of some of the German automotive industry to help oh, design, yeah. And he came up with conceptual art. We need it to look like a fish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they came up with some concept art, and they just kind of decided on the direction they wanted to go. And that's why you see, like, the knob on the bottom of the pistol grip mm -hmm. and stuff like that that doesn't really serve much function. That was part of the artistic flair that came from that design committee. Hmm. Yeah, Interesting. absolutely. Okay. The swoop on, up top, that was part of it. Okay. Um, but that So they did that. And then looked at taking the G36 mechanism and adapting it to that package. Okay. All right. That's essentially how that shook out. It's yeah. a modernized, modified that, G G36. That sounds kind of like the development process for the the Vector CR21. Let's design something that looks cool and then figure out how to cram a golly it, on yeah. inside it. Yeah. So that's that's how that shook out. Obviously, it takes G36 mags. Okay. Um, internally, it's essentially a G36. Interestingly enough, the actual XM8, believe it or not, the components, many of the components were slightly dimensionally different and did not directly interchange with it. Yeah, as bizarre as that is, I don't know if that was overall package size. It's probably what it was, but dimensionally, the stuff was slightly altered, actually a little bit smaller. So it was not a direct, you know, changeover one to one with the G36. Now, some of the stuff was obviously right. the magazine, I'm sure the gas piston, the pusher rod, all stuff like that was probably just direct G36 uh, changeover, or copied right over. But it was a little bit different in that regard. I gotta say, I was surprised by how, it's not a heavy rifle, but it's kind of a bulky rifle. It's larger than I was expecting when I picked it up from having seen pictures. Yeah, and you know, the G36 is kind of in that category too. You When you get used to an M4, the M4 in a lot of ways is a fairly slim, 
yeah. easy to manipulate gun. When you pick up a lot of its competitors, they're a lot different. And G36 is one of them. It's it's a bulkier, chunkier gun than a lot of people might think. And the X-8 is too. The ARX-160 is kind of like that. Absolutely. Yeah. If anything, the ARX-160 takes this to the next level yeah. in that regard. Now, so most of this is pretty typical. I mean, this all goes back to the AR-18. It's an AR bolt with a Tokarev gas system. Absolutely. Uh, but it has a kind of a unique optic on it. This is like, does everything. Yeah, Insight was the partner on this and it took them a while to come online that's why you'll see a lot of exomates on the internet actually are pictures of either most of them are airsoft by the way most okay. of the ones you see on the internet are airsoft the ones you see that are actual xmates in many cases early on were a, a, an optic mock-up hmm. that hk made with the hensolt g36 optic and uh -huh. they kind of mocked up what eventually Insight came out with, because Insight was kind of behind the power curve, and that's the, the ISM, Integrated Sight Module, has a okay. red dot sight, okay. and it has integrated IR laser. Okay, and, and visible? Or and visible, I believe so. I know, okay. you know, on the U.S. military, or excuse me, the U.S. civilian and law enforcement market, they introduced, I believe, the ISMV, if I remember correctly, which was a visible laser only, no IR laser. Right. And they sold it on the market. I don't think Insight offers okay. it anymore. So I know one of the issues with the lasers is there's this whole danger. There, there are different levels of lasers based on power and what can be legally sold commercially in the U.S. And infrared, like the same power infrared is a step more considered more dangerous because you can't see it. So you don't know if it's being sh shown in your eye. Right. And so that's the reason there's not much in the way of commercial IR laser. Exactly. In the, US. the interesting thing about this was, and I really liked it, and it's still fairly unique. There's other red dot sites, or there's other optics out there that do this, but this was one of the most notable and one of the first. When you zeroed the red dot site, you automatically zeroed the lasers. Oh, that's cool. Because they were slaved, slaved together. together. Nice. Yeah, they were on the same optical bench. So when you zeroed the red dot, you zeroed the lasers, which was actually pretty cool. That's pretty slick. You know, zeroing an infrared laser is kind of a tricky yeah. thing. Yes. And then now, of course, what you see is many laser modules, the, the visible is slaved to the IR. Right. So when you go to zero, the, you've now zeroed the, right. the, the IR. So that, that's, that's kind of how that's morphed. In this case, it was a red dot sight. couple things. Okay. That's pretty cool. As a red dot sight, to be brutally honest with you, it was kind of lame. Okay. Um, it didn't have a lot of battery life. Insight Technologies really, they're they are not the first people that come to mind when you think of red dot sites. This I true. actually made, when I worked at HK, I actually made a recommendation to them like, hey, why don't you guys try to partner up with Aimpoint and like take advantage of their red dot site technology to make the red dot site better and then you guys dial in the lasers. They really had no interest in that. In that. I don't know if there was an ITAR issue, mm -hmm. I, maybe wanting to try to keep everything in house. I, I don't know, but it, to be real honest with you, as a red dot site goes, it was not really that great. Okay. Now, what was what's the deal with the rest of the rifle? Because this went into U.S. trials, never came out of U.S. trials. What happened to it? Politics over eventually overwhelmed it. The, the guy who tried to honcho it, I believe his name was General Moran, he kind of almost tried to do an end around. Hmm. in a way to try to get a new rifle in service and it does things don't really work that way and then you got a lot of player powerful players here in the united states that had u.s manufacturing facilities such as coal and fn and whatnot and they have the ear of senators and congressmen so once this thing really got on the radar screen politics killed it okay. i mean honestly is how how it shook out a, a lot of people early on saw that coming kind of like i see what you're trying to do here I just don't think this is going to fly, and ultimately it did not. Okay. You know, it's kind of like there's a way to do this process, and it's certainly flawed. It's not perfect by any means, but you got to kind of let everybody play. Okay. You can't just say, "Hey, these guys are going to develop the new infantry rifle for the U.S. Army," and and you know you don't have a lot to say about it. That's not kind of how that works, unless you're Springfield Armory, but they don't exist anymore. Exactly, so. you're right. Well, <laughs> well said. So that's how this kind of worked. Um, the gun went through a significant number of developments over time. Okay. Uh, to be honest with you, it was a it was a good gun. You told me while you were working at HK, you actually had a fair amount of trigger. Time yeah, I did. Things. When I worked at HK, I worked there for about five six months after I got out of the military, and then I went back in. I I became a contract instructor back at the military in Fort Bragg, and I remained a HK consultant for a while afterwards. But mm -hmm. it was 
I was really focused on the 416 project to get it up online. But concurrently, there were people at HK working XM8. Okay. So what would happen is different taskings would come down. We'd have to go out and do demonstrations, VIP you know, presentations and whatnot with the gun. And depending on who was kind of in the hopper, you would go out and do that. And I, I did it more than once. I mean, okay. I went out more than once, demonstrated the gun, even came down to Fort Bragg one time mm-hmm. with it, demonstrated the gun, got some trigger time behind it, and showed the features. So I've, I've actually shot the guns in their different configurations quite a bit. So how do you think these compare to the M4? You know, here's my theory on it. The gun was still in its infancy. It definitely had things that needed to be sorted out. I okay. mean, there was a heat issue up front. The handguard would get incredibly warm. That was going to have to be sorted out. The whole P-cap thing. These, P-cap. I don't know what that is. Okay, P-caps are these holes here. And okay. initially, from what I understand, Jim Schatz, who's, who's since passed away, relayed the story that when he went to HK in Obendorf in Germany with General Moran and showed them kind of their concept with a Picatinny rail, Moran shot it right down off the bat. He goes, I don't want that. Hmm. That's old school. I want something new. I Get that out of here. I don't want to see that. So Jim kind of presented to him, hey, what about this scope mounting system that HK's used over the years on their hunting rifles? Because you go back to the HK commercial hunting rifles, they had a type of scope mount that would kind of lever in and then you would throw this cam lever and lock it into place. He said, what about this? Uh, and we could adapt this for, for you know, accessory mounting points. And the general said, oh man, that's a great idea. And I came up with uh, PCAP, which I believe is Picatinny Combat Accessory Point. Don't hold me to that. Okay. But it's essentially... It's those HK style scope mount, you know. It sounds kind of like mounting. a different iteration of something like M Lock. It is. It's kind of a predecessor to M Lock. M Lock, of course, has you know it's square. This is as an oval type thing, okay. kind of almost egg shaped when it locked in. Okay. The optic locks in that way. If you, oh, if you're aware of any of the older HK scope mount setups on their hunting rifles that's exactly how it works. Okay. The problem with it is there was only a, a few places to mount anything. There's four on this side, four on this side. You had, I believe, four on the bottom. Okay. And then you have two here for the optic. So if you wanted to put your white light or your laser or your pistol grip or whatever you wanted, you were locked into those positions. Modularity-wise, in that regard, you're painted into a corner. Okay. So ultimately, what was going to end up happening with this thing, as a matter of fact, they made some prototypes at the end to submit to the SCAR trials, is they had basically an XM8 with Picatinny rails. Okay. So you had a Picatinny rail... Uh, four end and even had a pickup tinning rail top. That's kind of where things eventually would have uh, would have went with this thing. Okay, for sure. I I remember seeing stories about they'll melt. Was that is that just the result of the handguards getting hot? Yeah, that, that that's, it's just they get very hot. And what happens just like with the G thirty six, the the polymer gets hot and it takes a long time to cool down. Hmm. Now, a couple things. HK was aware that the G thirty six, when pushed to extremes, had some issues with heat. Okay. They had intentions with the XM8 to, to put some remedy in place to, to answer that. The problem is the program was so rushed, they didn't really have a chance to do that early on. Okay. Where essentially the trunnion, the optical bench, all that is kind of, I, I used to use the terminology skeleton, where it was all kind of in alignment, and the polymer itself was just a shell around it, but had no real bearing on mm-hmm. maintaining zero or anything like that. Okay. And they never really got there with this gun. Eventually, my guess is they would have. Because, I mean, you've got a, a steel trunnion molded into polymer. Once it gets hot, guess what? Right, that's so eventually going to cause problems. Exactly. And then, you know, so when you push a gun beyond its design parameters, you're setting yourself up for that. Okay. Beyond that, though, it seemed like a... I mean, it very seems like gun. it ought to be a good gun. It's it was, got the honestly, basic... it was a very good gun. Super reliable. The G36 itself is a very reliable gun. Okay. So it took the reliability from the G36. I like the gun because it had excellent controls. Okay. The ambi safety. It had an enhanced magazine release. It had two wings that came off mm-hmm. the magazine release and extended back on either side of the trigger guard kind of like a like a p7 in a way yeah okay. in, a, in a way yeah pointing to the rear so you could hit it with like an ak style flapper or g36 flapper or you could just put your tr- push your trigger finger down hmm. with those extensions and knock it out 
Also, the bolt release was in the front portion of the trigger guard and was ambi. So and you could use that a number of ways. You could use it with your trigger finger or what I preferred to do, I'd put the magazine in and then my thumb would go in and, and hit the bolt release to send the bolt forward. So the gun was completely ambi. Okay. And it's got this G36 Six style, style ambi ambi charging, handle. charging handle up there. To be honest with you, that was one thing that myself and many others kind of wanted to see them address. In order to get your hand in there, that that forced the optic to be, in my opinion, too high, too high on the gun. There is a really high bore off. So Absolutely. Nice. So one thing, my thought process, and you see it now with like the HK433, certainly the Bushmaster, you know, ACR, the Magpul Masada and whatnot, is mm -hmm. you kind of choose one side or the other. And that's the direction we wanted HK to go in. Okay. Let's get... Let's get the optic rail down lower and then allow the end user to pick one side or the other in terms of the charging handle and let him decide what okay. if he wants it left or right handed, which is really what you've seen now with the SCAR and all this other stuff. That's the direction we went in. Yeah, and that's not really all that critical for ambidextrous function. No, it's not. You can reach you set it up. Yeah, and... that's it. You can, right. You can run it one side or the other or you set yours up lefty right. or righty or whatever, whatever you want. And that's what you see now. I mean, HK433 is a good example of that. Okay. Very easily switched from one side to the other. So that was one thing we wanted them to, to address. This one had a retractable buttstock, did not fold, but they had prototypes at least in development that we're going to fold. Okay. Um, As a uh, AR-18 base, there's no recoil spring back here. No. So there's nothing to prevent you from doing a folding spring. Absolutely. Now this this is the longer variant. Okay. Believe it or not, the standard carbine, the baseline carbine was essentially the same length as an M4. Okay. But because the recoil spring was all housed in the receiver, you, you in order to get the same length as an M4, you only had a 12 and a half inch barrel, not a 14 and a half. So that, okay. because you had no recoil assembly going into the buttstock. So that, you lost some there. That was a little little trick that was going on there. And it was basically to keep everything housed within. You right. know, a little the, bit longer receiver. Yeah, exactly. And then the benefit you got from that is now you had the ability to have a folding stock if you, if you want it. I mean, it's like anything else in small arms design. As you know, there's no free lunch. Right. This is the full-size rifle. They, they, this is kind of what was going to be the sharpshooter carbine. So their theory was they would have this length gun. Uh, it's some a magnified optic, all right? And then the other one they had was kind of a, a squad automatic rep, rifle version or an LMG version, okay. which was going to be more or less the same setup, but they had a, a this handguard with bipod legs that folded in. Okay. So that's the length gun you have here. Initially, they had no iron sights. Hmm. It was optic only, and then later they got a push from a lot of people like, hey, you need irons. Okay. So what ended up happening, this is one that was set up with irons, it's got a hole in the top, and then it has a flip-up front sight that's adjustable for windage. Boop. There we go. All right. It, very oh, much okay. like the HK MG4 front sight. Basically okay. almost identical. So it's elevation and windage adjustable. And then you have a little. small little peep right back there. Okay. Which, yeah. Can... Tommy made that one. It will flip up. There so we go. There you go. Oh, and a perfect co-witness. So that's, that was where things were going. The other thing that was going on is they, uh, the Army wanted them to make the takedown pins captured. Because hmm. let's face it, HK, as you know... They never do that. They never do that. Kind of but the U.S. Army, you okay. know, M16, M4, always had captured takedown pins. So that was one thing that was developed late on was captured takedown pins. All right. Well, very cool. I plan on, you know, at some point getting together with Tom Bostick and doing a video on it. Um, real happy to have it. I, personally, I thought the gun had a lot of potential. You okay. know, it's like I was talking about. It's like a buddy of mine said, hey, it's, it's nothing that, uh, you know, 30 years and millions of dollars won't fix. I mean, look. Boy, that is the trouble with anything that tries to compete with the M16. Yeah. It's, it's been around for literally 50 years. Yeah. And then you're all, oh, my God, it's a piece of junk. And you go, wait a minute. You got to look where this gun's at in its infancy. Right. The thing about it, and I was telling you about this yesterday when we were talking about doing the video, all this modularity stuff you see now mm -hmm. all started with this gun. Okay. I remember hearing some Magpul people saying, oh, people are just saying the Masada is an American XM8. That's not true. Now, bullshit, it is true. <laughs> okay. All the modularity stuff that you see now with all these different guns started with the XM8. Okay. So, yeah, I see, like, I put up the video on the HK433 and everybody, oh, it's nothing but an ACR, it's this and that and the other, and everybody's comparing it to other guns. It's like, well, before you get too tough on HK, you need to understand something. All those guns you're mentioning are essentially 
coming from the XM8. That's where the, the modularity that we see today, different butt stocks, barrel lengths, hand guards, all this different stuff came from this gun. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what, I will definitely be keeping an eye on your channel because I want to see the video of this shooting, especially with your high-speed camera. Cool. So, keep an eye out for that, guys. Anything else we need to throw in about this? No, overall, it, it, it's sad the gun had a lot of potential, but at the same time, the, it had the, the fatal flaws were, the politics were such that, it, would, it honestly, it never really stood a chance. And the other thing is, even, even if it was a little bit better than the M16 or could have been with enough development... I kind of feel like the M16's a really well-optimized gun, and you're going to spend an incredible amount of money replacing it with anything. It so. is. Now, keep in mind, when this was coming online, a lot of the stuff we see today wasn't on the market yet. Okay. There's a lot of rail systems, butt stocks, magazines, hmm. whatnot, that this gun actually predates. Oh, what it... I should have even thought of this at the beginning. What's the? What kind of dates are we talking about? Well, you're guy? talking about... You know, 02, 03, 04. Okay. Right? Not long after 9-11. As you know, 9-11 was the explosion in the tactical firearms industry. And there's countless companies now, Bravo Company, Blue Force Gear, just to name a couple that I'm involved with, that either didn't exist at all or were very small players in the tactical industry at that time. So okay. it exploded. So when this gun was coming online, you didn't have okay. all the options that you have now. All right, so it really would have, have had some... It, it had some real potential. I mean, the M4 certainly had a, a jump start without a doubt, and you could point to different things it had going for it, but you did not have the, I mean, the, the industry support you do now or limitless, <laughs> yeah, you know, hand guards and just off the chart. Anything. Yeah. Anything now competing against an M4 platform is virtually hopeless, honestly. Yeah, I don't disagree. Well, Cool. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your expertise. You got us. it, man. Thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video.